When I visited Israel, which some of you, I think, have visited, one of the more sobering excursions was to a place called uh, Yad Vashem, the, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center. And they have tried to account for every single name of every single victim of, of this attempted genocide. It, this is not exactly a joyful, restful vacation. I, I don't suppose anyone has had the opportunity to visit a place like uh, the Dachau or, or Auschwitz or, yeah, yeah, not, uh, I'm chilling, I'm sure. I, I just learned that the Dachau concentration camp opened in March 22nd of 1933. That's six years before even the start of the war. It was the first of the German concentration camps and the only one kept open throughout the entire Nazi era. And it became like a model for every other concentration camp. Auschwitz, uh, uh, Buchenwald, uh, Bergen-Belsen, Ravensbrück. And DeKalb um, did not close until those barely living prisoners were liberated uh, by America's troops on April 29th, 1945, a day before Hitler's suicide. So it had this 12 year nightmarish run, and, and by the end of that run, over 200,000 human beings from across Europe were robbed of their freedom, and they were exploited and tortured, and for most, uh, eventually murdered on those grounds. And there are still preserved to this day on, on the site things like um, you know a ditch that the express purpose was to carry away the blood from the people who were shot in the head. It's hard to just imagine something that's so horrific in our relatively recent history. At the front gates of Dachau, an entrance um, that has woven into its steel the German phrase that was put on the entrance of every concentration camp, um, Arbit mach frei, work makes you free. And in this next picture, the door swings open and uh, there's guard towers and there's barbed wire and there's this vast area where the prisoners would gather for roll call. And then this next picture are the barracks designed for 40 men, but as you'll see in this next photo, they would force as many as 400 inside barracks that were designed for 40. Some were designed for just horrific medical experiments that just defy description. Um, this next picture is of the gas chamber d disguised as showers built toward the end of the war to speed up the execution of the prisoners. But nothing can capture what the liberators found themselves on that day in 1945. I went down a bit of a YouTube rabbit hole and uh, I just, I don't have the, you know, the heart or the stomach to show you some of the footage that was um, filmed that day. You know, it's interesting, it's both celebratory, um, uh, as the freedom was finally come, but also sickening what was caught on film. You know, American soldiers were not prepared for what they would stumble upon. They were so incensed, actually, when, when they came upon the camp. Um, the American soldiers shot 50 German prison guards right on the spot. The, there were piles of bodies. The ovens were being stoked fire still inside of them, the, the sickness and the malnutrition and the treatment of humans as animals. Some of the guards tried to uh, slip into prisoner garb to fit in, but you know the Americans got Jewish prisoners to suss them out. And uh, uh, of course the SS wouldn't have those tattoos on their arms, their numbering system. And it's heavy stuff, it's gross. You, you want to look away. And out of that whole experience, two simple words were invoked and still to this day. It's a combination of just two words that are among the most powerful words to utter. Two words are, 
never forget. Never forget. And, and often it's paired with another two words. Um, never again. Never forget and never again. We're in this series called Hereditary, what the Bible calls the sins of the fathers and, and how to break generational patterns of dysfunction. And the Bible makes it really clear that sin has a ripple effect. It's not something done in isolation. Let me, let me read the words again. The sins of the parents are laid upon the children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children's in the third and fourth generations. And we talked about when we started this series, um, you know, our families of origin are going to mark us in one way for good or not so good. And when it's not so good, it it leaves scars. When there is sin and dysfunction in a family, it affects the children and often the children of those children. Even when it's not intentional, you know, even when it's not malicious, there, there are sins of commission. You know, the things we actively do that we know are wrong. There are sins of omission, the things that are good that we choose not to do, things we ought to do but don't. I'd also say there are just issues of ignorance. You know, your mom may not have known how to be a good mom. Nobody showed her. Uh, nobody modeled it for her. She may have even thought that what she was doing was good and helpful when in fact it was damaging. And those four words, never forget, uh, never again, typify what, what many of us feel about what we went through as children. We, we don't forget what happened, uh, what we went through, how we were raised, the love that wasn't shown, the hurt that was thrown our way. We can't forget it. And if we're honest, sometimes... Um, we don't want to forget it. And so we make a vow, not only, um, well, not out loud necessarily, not even to anyone in particular, but we make a vow to ourselves. I will not be that kind of parent. I will not raise my children that way. I will not do to them what was done to me. I will be the mother I never had. I will be the father I never had. I will never forget, and I vow never again. You know, there are teachers much wiser, more knowledgeable, more experienced than I who will tell you there's a kind of spiritual bondage you can open yourself up to when you make these sorts of solemn vows, even if it's just to yourself. They might even seem noble in the moment, but... Um, in the end, they, they end up being like little hooks in your soul, ways of keeping score. But what if when we vow, never forget, never again, what if, what if that's only half right? Um, at least in terms of breaking free from the patterns of dysfunction, what if it is the right instinct to declare never again, but not necessarily never forget? What if the act of forgetting just might even be another step towards breaking the cycle? What if it's even the next step towards our, our healing? Last week, we talked about the importance of forgiving. And this week, I'd like to pitch to you the idea that it might even be appropriate at times to forget. There's a, there's a saying, you know, forgive and forget. It's, is that an axiom that's unhelpful cliche, or is there even some biblical wisdom in it? And I want to explore this through the story of one of the most dysfunctional family units ever. And... It's a family story that's captured for us in, in the Bible in r raw and unfiltered ways. The father was named Jacob. And throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. And Jacob was one of what we call the three great patriarchs of the people of Israel. In fact, he's called Israel. And, and it's from him that the people of Israel get their name. They are literally the people of Jacob, Israelites. Because Jacob had 12 sons and they became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel carrying their names. So you have the, you know, the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Dan and so on. And we use the word great when we refer to the, the great patriarchs, you know, Father Abraham and his sons. But um, sometimes as Christians, you, we have a hard time distinguishing between the significant people of the Bible who made you know, significant contributions to our history and our faith and then have to reconcile the fact that, well, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob had some serious dysfunction themselves. Like, not everything recorded in the Bible is meant to be emulated or admired. Uh, even if the Bible doesn't explicitly say that Abraham at times was a coward, that Isaac was a liar, or that Jacob was a deceiver. The dysfunction of this family was established at the very beginning before a single child was born. It started with one of the strangest marriages you could ever imagine. Jacob found the woman of his dreams, the one he wanted to marry. Um, her name was Rachel, very good. Rachel's father told Jacob that if he would just work for him for seven years, he would give his daughter's hand in marriage. And so Jacob worked for him for seven years. At the end of those seven years, it comes time for the wedding, and Rachel's father walks his daughter down the aisle, only he didn't walk down his daughter, Rachel. He walked down his other daughter, the oldest daughter, Leah. Presumably she had a veil on or something, because Jacob had been tricked. The deceiver had been deceived. And he'd been promised a daughter in marriage, but the father carefully didn't commit to which daughter, even though it was clear what daughter Jacob loved. Slick, slick. Jacob didn't want to marry Leah, but his father said, ah, oh, marry her, and then work for me another seven years, and then yes, you can marry Rachel. So it, it had been his, the father's long con this whole time. So Jacob married Leah, and then he worked another seven years for Rachel, and then finally he was able to marry the one, the love of his life. So two wives, but only one he truly loved. But hold on, the soap opera gets worse because one wife was able to have children and the other could not. And it was Leah who could and Rachel who couldn't. In fact, Leah was a baby-making machine. She bore Jacob son after son after son, one after another. In the end, she had eight sons. Six um, she gave birth to herself. Two were born by her servant, uh, Zil Zilpa. But, you know, in that culture of that day, they were considered Leah's children. I mean, it's already a complicated drama to say the least. Why not throw in another name to muddy the water here? But uh, not one child from Rachel, the one that Jacob really loved, until the very end, that is when Jacob was an old man, and then somehow, some way, after years of trying, she got pregnant and gave birth to a son. And that son's name was... Joseph, very good. I'm so glad you didn't yell out Jesus because that's usually the answer. But um, <clears throat> then out of the blue, she conceived again and this time gave birth to another son, Benjamin. And tragically, she, she died bringing Benjamin into the world. So here's the family now, 12 sons from Jacob's wives, but only two from his beloved Rachel, who was now dead. And let's pick up the story from here. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Joseph, Jacob 
had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Now let's stop here for a second. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. Big time dysfunction number one. Okay, big time dysfunction number two, he showed it. He played favorites based on that love, giving things to Joseph and doing things for Joseph that he didn't do for the others. Showy things, things you couldn't miss, things that every other son would would know and see. Imagine it's Christmas morning, 10 sons, here are your bicycles. Oh, and Joseph, here are the keys to the Camaro. Like some of you in this room know all too well the pain of living as the disfavored sibling. Maybe you were even conscious of being the favored sibling and, that, and the sort of mind games it must have played on you, how it, it set you up to be resented, how it put pressure on you that you didn't ask for. Parents, you know, with all the learning and all the education and the good child-rearing books that we have in 2024, it just, it still amazes me how many moms and dads in subtle and not so subtle ways, in unconscious and in conscious ways. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> Is it, I was hoping for something stronger than water, but you know what? Oh, it is. Oh, good. Thank you. No. Um, That we still pit each other, siblings against each other as parents. Ah, God is not pleased. I I gotta tell you, it's a sin that goes back to Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob all reflected it and it, it has profound effects, ripple effects. And so these two big dysfunctions of Jacob led to a big time dysfunction number three, and it's so obvious and inevitable, it made the other brothers hate and resent their brother, which led to verbal and emotional abuse. And then, to add fuel to the fire, Joseph started having dreams and made the mistake, maybe even the prideful sin of telling them about it. Let me read it. One night, Joseph had a dream And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. Listen to this dream. He said, we were out in the field tying up bundles of grain and suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams. You think you're better than me? Um, Now, where was Jacob during all this? He knew he was playing favorites. He knew the other sons hated Joseph. He even knew about the dreams because Joseph had told him about them. And he knew that it was making his brothers hate him more. So he was completely aware, completely informed. So what did he do? Did he stop playing favorites? No. Did he try and stop the abusive behavior of his sons toward Joseph? No. What did he do? Nothing. Here's what the Bible records about his reaction, Genesis 37, 11. His father kept the matter in mind. Oh, good for you, Jacob. That and a loony will get you a cup of coffee, maybe. He, he just stored it away mulled it over a bit. I wonder why they don't like Joseph very much. I wonder why they hate him. I wonder why my family is so dysfunctional. So you have a father who not only set the family up for dysfunction by having two wives and playing favorites based on which wife the children had come from, but he's passive and clueless about the dysfunction that he's created. How did this all play out? Not well. Here's the next chapter of the story. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks. And when they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along. Jacob said, then come back and bring me a report. Now, just read between the lines there. Uh, 
10 have been sent out to work. Joseph wasn't. Uh, When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him at a distance. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into the cistern. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into a cistern. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of traders taking a load down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? His blood would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those traitors. After all, he is our brother and our flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the traitors came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern, sold him for 20 pieces of silver, and the traitors took him to Egypt. Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with the message, look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? How's that for a functional, healthy family? And all the one on the receiving end of it all, this kid who has been thrown in a well and now shipped off to Egypt, if you know much about the rest of this story of Joseph, it didn't get much easier. Sold into slavery by his own brothers, bought by an Egyptian official, He's then wrongfully accused of attempted rape by the official's wife. That leads to prison. He's betrayed in prison there as well um, by the people he tried to help get out. Um, It was as if everyone he trusted, everyone he tried to serve, everyone he tried to love, hated him, betrayed him, abused him. And it all started with his family. And... but what was the final chapter? Would, would, his, would his life end in bitterness and resentment toward them? Would he just end up creating a dysfunctional family like the one that he had come out of? In a mirror image, um, you know, because that's all he knew, we don't have time to go through the whole story. You really need to read it sometime because it's one of the, it's one of the great stories of a great life in the latter half of Genesis. Through it all, and I mean through it all, Joseph modeled integrity and faith in God. When he was falsely accused of rape as a slave, he should have been sentenced to death. But because of Joseph's integrity, that official sensed that it was false. So to protect Joseph, maybe to save face, he was only sentenced to prison. While in prison, He handled himself with such character that he was put in charge of the other prisoners. Has that ever happened in our criminal system? You know, one of those prisoners was a high official or a former high official of Pharaoh himself who had been falsely imprisoned. And when he was exonerated, he returned to his high rank. And when Pharaoh started having some disturbing dreams and wanted them interpreted, nobody could. Then the official remembered how closely Joseph walked with his God and he told Pharaoh about about him. And so he sent for Joseph and God enabled him to interpret this dream, just like Daniel had done. We talked about him in the fall. Turns out his dream was about this coming seven years of bounty followed by seven years of famine. And this is what Joseph told Pharaoh. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there will be seven years of famine, so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. The Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years. 
that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so that there will be food in those cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Y'all can smell what's coming here. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of these dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand, placed it on Joseph's finger, He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And whenever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then everything played out just like Joseph dreamed it would. And yes, his brothers were forced to come to Egypt like everybody else to get food during the famine. And yes, they bowed down before him like everybody else without even recognizing who he was. But he recognized them. The dreams that he had all those years ago were now being fulfilled. But he was kind to them. He was forgiving of them. And he made sure they were all cared for. And, and what was behind it? Um, how, could, how could he be that way toward these cruel brothers? I've spent the whole morning leading up to this moment right now. I told you all that to tell you this. The Bible gives this little detail, one you could easily miss about Joseph and his family. And I think it's key to all that happened to him and how he dealt with it. And we find out about it when we're told about Joseph's own family, the birth of his first son, and specifically what he named him. He named his first son Manasseh, which is Hebrew for forget. Strange choice for a child, granted. I'd like you to meet my daughter uh, drawing a blank on you. She's a lovely daughter. Um, How did he do that? Or why did he do that? The Bible records Joseph's own words in Genesis. Here he says, Joseph's name, Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, causing to forget. For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and hardship and all the sorrow and loss of my father's household. Here's what I take out of that. Joseph had reached a point of maturity by forgetting all the wrong that had been done to him. And that that forgetting was like a gift from God. Now, how does that work? Did he actually forget? Did God give him a case of holy amnesia? I I don't think so. But that's not the only way to forget because Joseph stayed true to God, trusted God with everything, including the pain of his childhood and much of his adulthood that resulted from what happened to him as a boy. Because he kept giving that to God, turning it over to God, looking to God for what would lie ahead, honoring God in whatever place he found himself in, God brought a new life out of the wreckage. He made Beauty from ashes, okay? He, he turned graves, or he turned, yeah, graves into gardens. And at every stage, Joseph kept looking forward, moving forward, trying to advance his life forward. So his forgetting was more like a choice, consciously putting it behind him, finding a new vision for himself, a new defining reality, becoming a father himself and creating a family that would be different. You know, he was breaking a cycle. He was was forging a new path 
Here's what the Apostle Paul would write many centuries later. Now that I have already obtained, or sorry, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Somebody say amen. As Joseph held his newborn baby's finger and named him Manasseh, it was as if instead of saying, never forget, never Again, Joseph was saying, never again, but Lord, help me forget. Help me keep forgetting so that I can move forward, take steps towards you as my new first loyalty of marriage, my new first loyalty as father, my new family of origin. And that's what's so important to remember. Our path to healing, our path to having the memory stop their, their torment on our psyche and our soul. Our path to filling the hole we have in our hearts. Um, it's a path forward. The marriages that we can have, the children we can raise, the families we can make, the homes we can build, the memories we can make, the love we can share, the patience and grace we can bestow, the time we can spend the tenderness, the gentleness that we can gift. The healing path is forward. And with each step on that path, we will increasingly be able to say, God has made me forget all my trouble and hardship and the sorrow of loss of my family's household. Why? Because now, instead of being about your your father's family, It's about you as a father of your family, you as the mother of your family. As we go to communion, this is probably one of the many times in our faith and in the Bible, and it's not a contradiction, but it's a tension where both things can be true at the same time. You know, look at the cross. It is both the most scandalous, horrific moment in history and the most beautiful. Beautiful and scandalous. Both things are true. And on the one hand, God says to us in the Psalms, you know, do you think a nursing mother could ever forget the child at her breast? There's more chance of that happening than I, your God, forgetting you. I will not forget you. But then on the other hand, he says in Hebrews, I will forgive their sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. Wait, the all-knowing, eternal, omniscient God of the universe can actually forget something? The one who has remembered the very hairs on my head can actually forget something about me? I don't understand it all. I don't know how this works. But the very worst parts of me, the worst acts, the things I have confessed and repented of and asked forgiveness for, God supernaturally, as an act of his grace, chooses to forget those things about me. And when he sees me, he just sees redeemed. He sees Jesus in me. There's something in that act, I think, that he is modeling for us. And and the seeming contradiction of communion even, where we're asked to remember, remember the sacrifice of the Lord, died for our sins, and in return, he not only forgives, but he chooses to forget. We started talking about the death camps of Dachau and Auschwitz. And it was, it was Corey Ten Boom who survived one of those death camps, watched her sister die there, and experienced radical forgiveness of, of those guards even, who came up with this line, God buries our sin in the sea of forgetfulness, and then he puts up a no fishing sign. 
There's no dredging that stuff up in God's eyes. This is the God who, in this weird dichotomy, his death brings us life. Our mourning will be turned into dancing, our ashes into beauty, our shame into glory, our dry bones into armies, our graves into gardens. So as you come this morning, there's even a gluten-free station here. Um, And this table is open to all who want to just take a step towards Jesus. Um, We remember, and part of that remembering is rejoicing that he has chosen to forget. Maybe there's something he's modeling for us in that.